Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Scott Sagan, the co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford. I'm really pleased uh, to introduce Professor Sharin Sinar from the Stanford Law School, who will be giving our seminar today. Um, Sharin has taught at Stanford since 2012. Her article, The Lost Story of Iqbal, won the 2017 uh, Mike Lewis Prize for National Security Legal Scholarship. She's written widely on national security, human rights, immigration policy, and other topics. And today she'll be talking about a forthcoming article in the California Law Review. I'll turn it over to Sharin, who will speak for 30 minutes approximately. For all of you who have questions, um, put them into the Q&A and I'll be um, culling through them and then we'll be um, raising different questions uh, to Professor Sinar. Sharin, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here for the seminar. Uh, so I wanna begin by taking you back to June 17th, 2015. And on that day, a young white supremacist shot dead nine African-American worshipers in Charleston, South Carolina, after sitting with them in a Bible study at the historically black Methodist Emmanuel African, uh, Mother Emmanuel African Methodist Church. And he said he did so in order to start a race war. Soon afterwards, a racist manifesto he had written appeared online, along with pictures of him flanked by a Confederate flag. And that incident evoked a long and horrifying history of white supremacist violence in this country that had long terrorized black communities. Surprisingly, as some of you may recall um, from that uh, moment, um, some political officials, including then FBI Director Jim Co James Comey, uh, described the crime as an apolitical act, as that of a lone depraved individual and South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham uh, described Dylan Roof as, quote, one of those whacked out kids. That response created immediate backlash. Many commentators said that that incident should be labeled and charged as terrorism to signify its political nature and uh, the systematic nature of white supremacy. And they pointed out that a Muslim or brown or black perpetrator would immediately have been designated a terrorist. In fact, many argued at that time uh, that recognizing the Charleston church massacre as a hate crime, um, that itself would not be enough because it didn't fully recognize or capture the political nature of the violence or convey the appropriate level of stigma. Over the next couple of years, of course, we've had a succession of high profile acts of white supremacist violence in places like Charlottesville, uh, the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, at an El Paso Walmart frequented by Latinx people. And after each of these incidents, media and policymakers asked, is this a hate crime or is this an act of terrorism? And increasingly there were calls, not just to label these acts uh, as terrorism, um, but also to change the treatment of domestic terrorism to make it more in line with how we have treated international terrorism. Uh, and since last year, since the siege of the Capitol on January 6th, there have been still more calls to ratchet up the legal treatment of terrorism, um, including through the Biden administration's uh, new strategy on domestic terrorism, which was released uh, last summer. So in this talk, I wanna take us above some of these specific policy debates over uh, responding to this form of political violence and address actually at a higher level how we think about white supremacist violence. I want to explore how the categories of hate crimes and terrorism became so dominant in our law and culture so that they have now become alternative frames for conceptualizing white supremacist violence. And I will argue that it matters how we frame political violence, uh, that the frames of hate crimes and terrorism diverge considerably in their legal, their cultural and political implications. So despite the rhetorical appeal for some of applying the terrorism label, I argue that um, against embracing and expanding that frame. Uh, and ultimately, I argue that neither frame, neither hate crimes nor terrorism 
captures an approach to dealing with white supremacist violence in a way uh, consistent with racial justice. So as uh, Professor Sagan mentioned uh, when we began, um, much of what I'll present today will be published in a law review article in uh, the California Law Review later this spring. Uh, it builds on some of my earlier work, both on uh, domestic and international terrorism and on hate crimes. Um, so I'll start with just a couple of very quick legal definitions. So when I refer to white supremacist violence, uh, I mean violence or the threat of violence by non-state actors motivated by a belief in the superiority of the white race. And um, that definition includes not just incidents like uh, of mass shootings as in Charleston, uh, but also violence by racist paramilitary groups that might be part of the militia movement. It can include assaults on people of color um, that uh, are you know, sought to be justified by stand your ground or citizens arrest laws. It can also include lower level acts of violence, such as physical assaults or intimidation aimed at driving non white residents out of um, a historically white neighborhood. My focus in this piece is um, and in this talk is on um, the acts of violence by private parties, but I want to just make clear at the outset that you know, what we might think of as private white supremacist violence has uh, long had a relationship to the state and state violence, and I'll circle back to this point um, later in my uh, remarks. At any rate, we are now at a point where researchers and security agencies uh, agree that far right violence and white supremacist violence presents a serious threat. Um, so, for instance, the Biden domestic terrorism strategy I just noted uh, describes white supremacists and anti-government militias as presenting the most persistent and most lethal among domestic terrorism threats. White supremacist violence often exists at the conceptual overlap between hate crimes and terrorism as these categories are typically defined. Um, and, and, and that's where I thought it would, might be helpful to start with a couple definitions, not to kind of adhere to these. Um, in fact, I think part of the purpose of my talk is to unsettle these categories and cause us to question them, uh, but to at least offer up um, what have um, been common understandings in, in the law. So hate crimes have typically been defined as crimes motivated, at least in part, by bias against particular identity groups, which categories are protected depend on the law in question. Uh, but the main idea is that a hate crime is thought to be a crime that targets a particular group defined by identity. And at the same time, we have uh, many different definitions of terrorism, even within US law. Uh, but a common legal definition, um, backed by uh, many common academic conceptions of the term, uh, identifies terrorism as unlawful, violent acts intended to intimidate a civilian population or influence government policy. And while not all bias motivated violence fits both definitions, there is an overlap. So white supremacist violence can fit standard legal definitions of both hate crimes and terrorism when it targets violence of a particular, uh, when it targets victims of a particular identity um, in order to achieve a broader political objective. There's of course nothing new about crimes motivated by bias or the use of violence to influence government policy, but the frames of hate crimes and terrorism as we now understand them evolved much more recently over the last several decades of the 20th century. So what do I mean by a frame? A frame is a way of organizing reality. We don't understand complex problems simply through kind of assessing their objective features one by one. Rather, we understand them through categories that political leaders, legal actors, the media, and social movements have constructed over time. And uh, sociologists, psychologists, communication scholars, public policy specialists, economists, and others have uh, separately in their own disciplines theorized uh, the power of framing um, in various respects. As I use the term, a frame is an organizing concept through which a particular set of laws, policies, practices, and social understandings defines and responds to a social problem. 
once frames take hold, they have power because we interpret problems through their limits. They are not inevitable and they are not permanent. In fact, they can be contested, um, but they influence our understanding and often lead to particular responses. The hate crimes frame began to develop in the early 1980s as a result of a couple of factors. It was both the result of civil rights advocacy by communities that felt unprotected um, from violence targeting them, uh, but it also arose against a backdrop of law and order politics and the conservative backlash to civil rights. And we see that in the form that hate crimes legislation took. And here I draw on the work of sociologists and legal scholars like Terry Maroney, Valerie Jenis, and Reichen Brittet, Eli Aronson, and others. Hate crime laws typically operate by lengthening the prison sentence of a person convicted of a crime when you can prove that the defendant acted out of bias. So if, for instance, the typical sentence for an assault uh, is three years, a hate crime en enhancement can lengthen that sentence perhaps to six years. The focus of hate crime laws uh, have long emphasized individual responsibility for hate violence. Um, and you know, the response to the problem of hate crimes is being largely about criminal punishment. And these laws gained traction in the time that they did, partly because they allowed political leaders both to support civil rights, uh, but also to be tough on crime at the same time. In some respects, hate crime laws arguably de-emphasized ideology and historical subordination. Uh, in part because of the Supreme Court's approach to free speech and equal protection doctrines, uh, these laws drew a sharp line between actual crimes and hate speech, and they also treated acts of bias the same without regard to whether perpetrators belonged to dominant communities um, or subordinated ones. The terrorism frame emerged a decade earlier, beginning in the 1970s, largely in response to acts of transnational political violence by Palestinian nationalists seeking an independent state. And that is the time period when the US government, media, um, and external experts largely came to first define terrorism as such as a pressing problem, um, including when the first US counterterrorism programs and institutions developed, including the very first programs to profile and surveil Arab American scientists uh, and, um, excuse me, students and activists. And here I'm drawing on the work of sociologist Lisa Stampnitsky, media scholar Deepa Kumar, and, and many others who have explored these roots. Beginning in the 1980s, the US government came to view terrorism as a form of warfare, not just a crime to be met by military rather than primarily international law or diplomatic strategies. And the conception of terrorism also increasingly took on civilizational overtones. Uh, it also became, over time, heavily associated with foreign and non-white threats, primarily Arabs and Muslims. All of these trends accelerated uh, after 9-11. So the US launched military actions around the world often justified by new doctrines of preemption and undertook aggressive preventative law enforcement strategies at home, often um, aimed at uh, surveillance of uh, large communities. US counterterrorism, whether it was at home or abroad, embodied an idea that the ordinary rule of law would often have to give way in the face of exceptional threats. So that is the brief historical backdrop. Um, and, and now I want to just focus for a few moments on uh, how uh, the hate crime and terrorism frames differ in their approach to um, a number of core factors, both social and, and legal consequences flowing from how these two phenomena are perceived. So hate crimes have been defined as a problem of criminal law and civil rights. Terrorism, for its part, is seen as a problem partly between war and crime, um, as a problem of national security. Uh, and as a national security issue, 
it is conceived as a problem that garners enormous state attention and resources. To just as an ex uh, provide one example of this, uh, the Brown University Cost of War Project uh, recently estimated that the US government has either spent or incurred $8 trillion in its wars on terror since 9-11 at the human cost of over 900,000 lives. As to their law enforcement approach, law enforcement agencies typically take a reactive approach to hate crimes focused on prosecution and uh, after the fact sentence enhancement, um, but an aggressive preventative approach to terrorism. Hate crimes perpetrators are seen as worse than other criminals. That's the, the rationale or one of the rationales for sentence enhancements. Um, but those identified as terrorists are seen as virtually irredeemable. Uh, and you know, while I don't have the opportunity here to kind of provide the evidence in great detail, I did want to give just one example of how this manifests in the law itself. Uh, so for instance, when uh, federal judges sentence federal defendants uh, for crimes, they're required to consult federal sentencing guidelines, uh, which consider both the nature of a crime as well as a person's prior criminal history, uh, history in deciding on the appropriate sentence. And they're both hate crime and terrorism enhancements in the law. The hate crimes enhancement allows for an increase in a sentence. So it does reflect this idea that a hate crime is in some respect worse than a different kind of crime, not motivated by bias. But the terrorism enhancement is far more consequential. It actually equates even a first time offender, so someone without any criminal history, um, as uh, the, the same as a person with the most serious criminal history possible. Um, and, you know, the assumption here seems to be that someone convicted of any terrorism crime, even if it's something like lying to a law enforcement agent, um, that by nature, that crime um, deserves a ratcheting up, kind of reflecting uh, the view that, uh, you know, perpetrators of, uh, you know, crimes constituted as terrorism crimes are uh, by nature uh, incorrigible. Uh, moving to the identity of victims and perpetrators, um, popular conceptions of both who commits terrorism and who is the victim differ considerably. So for hate crimes, the victims are typically seen as members of minority groups. Uh, in the case of terrorism, the victims are seen as the nation as a whole. Um, hate crime perpetrators are typically viewed as likely to be kind of white or members of a majority group. Terrorists are generally seen as Muslim or non-white, often foreign. And finally, when it comes to individual rights, these frames have had a different relationship to questions of judicial review, accountability, and courts. Uh, so courts have long restricted hate crime laws to protect free speech, whereas the Supreme Court has proven quite willing to bypass ordinary First Amendment protections and other individual rights in the case of terrorism. So these frames define and respond to political violence in very different ways. And just to be clear about the contours of my argument, um, the move to frame white supremacist violence as terrorism you know, does not kind of automatically you know, generate wholesale the, uh, the consequences of a terrorism frame or the, you know, the characteristics that I've associated with that frame. Um, so for one thing, there are existing legal constraints on domestic terrorism that differentiate the tools that the government use compared to what it has considered international terrorism. Uh, and above and beyond that, the racial and political identity of white supremacists will insulate that group from some of the harshest elements of the traditional terrorism frame. Nonetheless, we can expect that the move to reframe white supremacist violence as terrorism will push it further towards features of the terrorism frame. And uh, ultimately, I argue that uh, both the terrorism frame is problematic, uh, but also that neither of these frames actually addresses white supremacist violence in a way consistent with racial justice. Uh, so to begin with, the hate crimes frame is in fact a limited frame for addressing white supremacist violence. It fails to recognize the systematic character of the threat or structural causes, treating it as one of prejudiced 
individuals. That frame has never garnered the level of prioritization or resource allocation as one uh, would want. It is oriented largely at after the fact enforcement of criminal law. And in some respects, it actually minimizes pathologies in the criminal justice system by focusing on uh, the enhancement of prison terms, meaning lengthening prison sentences as the primary legal response. While a terrorism frame appears to provide a degree of stigma, urgency, and systematic perspective on the nature of the threat, there are significant risks with adopting that frame, especially when it comes to enacting new legal powers for security agencies or law enforcement. And that's actually the reason that uh, in the last uh, year or so, hundreds of civil rights groups uh, across affected communities have opposed the creation of a new domestic terrorism criminal charge. So I'm going to briefly go over uh, some of what I see as some of the uh, 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 most significant risks with adopting a terrorism frame. So first, once you define a problem as terrorism and national security, you shift power to the agencies and experts that have developed over time to address terrorism and national security. But those institutions are often secretive, less accountable than other political institutions, and detached from communities of color. There's been a lot of conversation in recent discussions of police reform about the importance of shifting power to communities most affected. The move to frame white supremacist violence as terrorism actually goes in the opposite direction. It not only empowers security agencies, but also along with it, a private terrorism consulting industry with little gatekeeping or independence. Second, once you frame a problem as terrorism, you invite a counterterrorism response. But current counterterrorism programs have built in a mentality of focusing on prevention um, without regard or sufficient regard to its costs, at least with respect to violence by Muslims. Over a million people are now on terrorist watch lists, for instance, that are premised on uh, a vague and low threshold of reasonable suspicion um, of an undefined relationship to terrorism. Um, we have uh, sting operations directed at young men, which often involve um, informants or undercover FBI operatives providing, in some cases, financial, emotional, and psychological pressure to individuals to induce them to support a terrorist activity. Um, and in these cases, you know, these, uh, you, you know, the mechanism of law enforcement operations, you know, raise the concerns that individuals targeted would not have acted in the absence of um, long-standing, um, nearly coercive government intervention. Law enforcement agencies understate the harm of preventative policies on individuals, communities, and democracy, and overestimate their ability to identify truth threats from uh, wider groups of people. So in my view, we need to uh, reinforce accountability and rein in programs like terrorist watch listing or the use of sting operations, which are premised on the possibility of a future threat rather than expanding them. And third, you know, while we may think that political and racial dynamics may uh, insulate white supremacists from some of the most aggressive counterterrorism measures, other racial groups will not likely benefit from that same level of protection. So the fear here is that historically, the harshest security measures have targeted racial minorities and those who appear to be contesting the dominant socioeconomic or racial order. And uh, the concern now is that the fallout from expanded uh, from an expanded legal uh, regime for domestic terrorism may not ultimately be on white supremacists, even if that's the call that's motivating expansion right now. Um, but the fallout may include or be largely be on um, groups like indigenous protesters disrupting oil pipelines or people of color and their allies 
uh, protesting police brutality. So my primary goal in this talk uh, is to unsettle our existing frames rather than to map out a detailed policy blueprint. I want to make clear that I'm not arguing that every law or policy that is designated a hate crime law or an anti-terrorism policy is necessarily um, you know, problematic. So decisions about individual laws and policies have to be made carefully um, in a way that respects the gravity and complexity of the problem. Uh, but I argue that we shouldn't be hemmed in by the limits of the existing hate crime or terrorism frames. And in thinking through an approach more consistent with racial justice, an important starting point is that formulating responses must uh, involve, include, and center communities that have often borne the brunt of white supremacist violence without necessarily being part or as significant a part of um, formulating policy responses. So it has to be a deliberative process that empowers affected communities. Those who theorize racial justice, whether among academics, writers, or activists, often emphasize several themes uh, that I want to close with um, because I think they are especially relevant to evaluating any frame or approach to white supremacist violence. So one core racial justice theme is the systematic nature of violence undertaken in the US in the name of white supremacy. So the idea that incidents like Charleston or El Paso aren't aberrational, but connected to historical violence that has never been fully addressed. Many writing in this vein echo themes from the international transitional justice field, uh, which explores how societies account for and ultimately seek to move beyond histories of conflict and oppression. Uh, so many thinkers call for things like memorials, educational efforts, reparations on lynchings and historical state violence as a way of coming to terms with the past in order to reduce the, the likelihood of repetition. Um, and these efforts, importantly, place responsibility on society as a whole, not just on individual perpetrators. A second racial justice theme relevant uh, to uh, addressing white supremacist violence is the relationship with state violence and repression. So while both the hate crime and terrorism frames uh, see uh, uh, the, the state, state actors as protectors, not perpetrators, private white supremacist violence is, of course, connected with state policies as well as state institutions. And we have often seen a flow of both ideas, personnel, even weaponry between uh, state institutions like law enforcement agencies in the military and private white supremacist groups. So understanding and addressing those relationships has to be a part of framing white supremacist violence. And finally, a lot of racial justice activism focuses on undoing our society's over-reliance on criminal law and law enforcement solutions to social problems. And while I believe that law enforcement has an important role in addressing white supremacist violence, a racial justice approach to white supremacist violence uh, must consider broader forms of accountability beyond criminal law and incarceration. So at one level, that means you know, looking to and emphasizing forms of political accountability for those in power who support and enable white supremacist violence not just the low hanging fruit of those who might say um, respond to calls um, for such violence. Um, and it may even include in some cases individual restorative justice approaches for at least a subset of cases where both offenders and survivors are open to an alternative process for healing victims and holding perpetrators accountable. So I've just opened up uh, a lot of questions. Um, I think the policy questions are complex, they're difficult. Uh, and uh, for now, I think the point that I want to most uh, convey is that addressing this problem has to begin with recognizing how the hate crime and terrorism frames have shaped our social and legal treatment of political violence and how they continue to limit our imagination. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to start off and I want to encourage, uh, we have a, a really impressive set of people uh, in the audience. Uh, I want to encourage them to put their uh, questions in the Q&A uh, so that I can, I can call on you uh, or read your question. Um, I want to um, have you explain one of the um, uh, differences between the hate crime and, and the terrorism frame where you talked about law enforcement. I don't see why hate crimes all have to have a reactive rather than a preventive strategy. It has to do with warning. If you have warning that a hate crime is coming, then why can't law enforcement also have a, a, a preventive strategy as much in that arena as it would with a terrorist attack? Is that a, a, a logical argument or is it a just empirical observation that you have? Well, it, it's an observation, not of something that's inevitable, but in the way that hate crimes responses have been shaped and developed for the last 40 years. So the focus on hate crimes legal responses has largely been about sentence enhancement. That has been the primary legal remedy. And when individual, say, police departments have been trained to respond to hate crimes, the focus again has been on after a hate crime occurs, how do you investigate it to be able to discern a bias motive? How do you prosecute it? And how do you ultimately, in terms of prosecutors, how do you um, seek to prove uh, a bias motive for purposes of sentence enhancement? So it's not so much that these are inevitable features of any label or concept of applied to a problem, but that is in fact how that model has developed um, for, you know, for multiple decades. So it's not inevitable, but um, that, you know, when that has been the practice, then uh, categorizing and conceptualizing a problem as such tends to, at least initially, uh, limit you towards thinking about the problem in terms of the approach that's been taken and built up. Yeah. And is it partly due to who's in charge of that? That is, the FBI tends to be more reactive and other uh, bureaucracies in the US government, military and CIA tend to be more preventive? I actually wouldn't say that's the case because in the case of terrorism, the FBI has explicitly embraced um, what I would say is an unduly aggressive preventative approach from you know right after 9-11. So it's not so much that it's with you know outside the capacity of the agencies. Um, in fact, if anything, I think the FBI has quite a um, built up a quite problematically preventative approach to, to terrorism. Um, and just if I can say one thing about that, I mean, prevention sounds like a good thing, right? You know, if, the, the, if there's a problem that's high stakes enough that we're concerned enough about, you know, at some level, of course, we want to try to prevent a problem from becoming a reality or um, becoming escalated rather than simply addressing it after the fact. Right. Uh, the question is the type of mechanisms that you uh, apply to it. Um, and, and that is primarily the nature of my concern. Um, I have Herb Lynn. I think I've, if I've done this correctly, Herb, you can actually ask your own question. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a fascinating talk here. Um, you you raised the, the the question uh, of you know an important question here of the way in which uh, counterterrorism programs and so on have been implemented and how they uh, have been implemented conflicts with uh, demands of racial justice and and, and so on. Uh, and I'm wondering whether. Uh, there is a an inherent trade-off uh, between um, uh, you know, minimizing the negative racial justice effects uh, and um, uh, and effectiveness. Uh, whether, whether or not I mean th that is one of the questions that the, sort of implicitly in, in, in all of this. Uh, if there is an inherent trade-off, then well, maybe you have to just accept that. Um, you know, choose one or the other. But if there isn't, maybe the solution is is to try to minimum just minimize the, uh, the 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 negative effects on racial justice. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, I think the question of trade offs. If you apply it to a particular program or policy approach, you know, you may often have trade offs with deciding whether or not, um, in some context, you want to apply, say, a, you know, particularly aggressive policy that um, may involve, you know, netting, say, um, you know, a large number of people who may not have gone on to commit an act of violence or may not, in fact, present a threat, um, but um, who, uh, you know, may. Um, 
in, uh, trigger suspicion for some reason. I mean, there, you know, there are classic questions about false negatives and false positives that apply to many particular programs. Um, but I think that those, um, you know, the framing of trade-offs is often kind of overblown. I mean, there's this almost an expectation that uh, programs that we have adopted are rational and that therefore you can only say minimize um, false positives um, by you know, in, uh, increasing your risk of false negatives. So that, uh, the, you know, the, the trade-offs framing of security measures, I think, um, often blinds us to the ways in which uh, policies that often have, you know, really large or disproportionate effects in communities uh, may in fact also not be effective. Uh, so I try, you know, I often react to kind of the, a trade-offs framing um, with a bit of suspicion because I think it sometimes, um, uh, you know, blinds us to the ways in which we can actually get better policy that uh, improves, um, you know, th th that is better both in terms of effectiveness and uh, in terms of inclusion and, and racial justice. So I think you're, I think you're answering, your answer is no, there is not necessarily an inherent trade-off. And that's fine. That would be, that would be a perfectly reasonable answer, but I'm just wondering if that's what you're saying. That is what I'm saying. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Martha Crenshaw, we have our own uh, terrorism specialist, uh, retired professor from Stanford. Uh, thanks for joining us on the Zoom call, Martha. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Everybody, wonderful. Well, thank you for that talk, Sharon. It was really very, uh, very, very interesting to me. And my question is, I wonder where you would put countering violent extremism efforts in your sort of uh, dual framework, uh, CVE, to those of you familiar with the jargon. This has been a big emphasis under Obama, uh, under Biden, sort of developing community resilience. And the Biden administration is very focused on the local and community level and sort of, you know, education sort of uh, extremism as learning and teaching people not to go in this direction. How would that fit into your frameworks? Right. Um, well, I think um, with CVE, the conception of it is that these are a series of programs that aim to reduce the risk or appeal or, or reduce the appeal of violence uh, and that do so outside the context of purely uh, prosecuting individuals and landing them in prison. So the way that it was initially presented, I think, during the early Obama years was that these were a series of softer approaches to dealing with counterterrorism that were oriented at being more community based. Over time, um, what uh, as these programs were rolled out, uh, many in communities felt that rather than being a replacement or an alternative to kind of the harder counterterrorism law enforcement approaches, they actually just expanded the reach of those approaches by, for instance, inviting mental health practitioners and social service workers and others in non-law enforcement contexts to collaborate with, share information with, and so on um, with law enforcement. Uh, and I think some of those same concerns um, remain in newer kind of iterations of uh, the DHS approach to you know, the prevention of, of terrorism and targeted violence. So those concerns have not gone away. That said, you know, the types of programs that we might be talking about are quite broad. And the ones that concern me the most are the ones that are aimed at identifying particular individuals as risky and intervening um, in, in particular ways. So it's, it's essentially, it's the risk assessment, assessment side of this um, that involves, I think, some of the most concerning aspects of, of CVE. So to the extent that CVE involves things like, um, uh, you know, broad-based education programs aimed at teaching kids to recognize uh, disinformation online or, you know, media literacy campaigns over social media aimed at, you know, a variety of, you um, um, you know, disinformation or messaging or, or so on, that you might broadly consider CVE, someone might actually apply for a grant for that through the context of these programs, and that doesn't concern me so much as the individualized risk assessment approaches that have um, in practice often expanded uh, the surveillance reach of law enforcement agencies. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, this question about labels or frames has uh, gotten a lot of publicity recently because of a, 
very strange conversation between Tucker Carlson and Ted Cruz, where Cruz had called the January 6th insurgents terrorists and, and was called out and, uh, and apologized uh, uh, on, on Fox uh, for doing that. Um, when you think about something like the perpetrators of the January 6th insurrection, what kind of, of, of legal frame should we be taking to understand them and to punish and or prevent um, uh, in, in the future? Can you, can you use your analysis of these other, many other incidents in this framework to try to understand how we should go about dealing with January 6th? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know that there's a particular uh, you know, one word label that I can give you that I think fairly represents the phenomenon of what happened on January 6th. So I think there were aspects of it certainly that involved, you know, organized attempts to subvert a congressional proceeding that would lead to the certification of an election. Of course, that was, um, you know, what was happening by and large. And so, you know, whether you would want to call it, um, uh, I mean, so many terms have been offered. I think each of them is somewhat problematic, whether it's an insurrection or a seizure or anything else. Um, they capture elements of what was going on. Um, where I'm a bit reluctant to apply any of these labels wholesale is that what brought people to the Capitol was not all the same thing. So I think in some ways, like, you know, when we think of this as one phenomenon, um, then that's where we end up kind of conflating the different motivators that brought people there. You know, so there's a group of people who are organized, involved with groups like the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters and the Oath Keepers, you know, organized kind of paramilitary movements that had planned to kind of fight for Trump long before um, that uh, January 6th itself uh, occurred. And that kind of violence, I think, um, and those uh, individuals ought to be thought of differently um, compared to some of the more kind of ordinary uh, Trump supporters who bought the lie of a stolen election, yet did so without necessarily any kind of premeditated attempt um, to uh, to have the the you know the result that others were campaigning for, um, and who may have. Um, gone into the Capitol with, you know, a somewhat different set of expectations. Um, so I think, you know, while there is an important desire to say that what happened on January 6th was, you know, every stigmatic term available, right? You know, you know, reprehensible, horrific, dangerous, all of that, and it was. Um, but at the same time, um, I think it's problematic to kind of just lump in all of those who participated and kind of tar everyone um, with the same broad brush. Um, and, you know, I think more generally when we think about kind of these categories of extremism or terrorism or whatever you want to call it, um, I think those categories sometimes point us to the, the people on the fringes, the people who are most um, in, uh, you know, who are using violence, threatening violence, um, but what they don't get at is the much larger proportions of populations that can sometimes um, support the set of ideas that um, may um, you, you know, be equally dangerous from a democratic perspective. So if you now look at uh, public opinion research on what people think about political violence, there are alarming proportions of Americans um, who say they support political violence under certain conditions, like if you believe that an election was stolen. Those numbers have risen over the last couple of decades in quite problematic ways. I mean, it's, you know, it's more than a third of, of, of Americans, and it may have been even more, I don't recall the number. So I guess in thinking of, through these questions, I do think it's important to sort of separate out categories of people and think about what are we doing um, to counter the kinds of narratives and disinformation that are leading actually alarming proportions of our population to say they might potentially support political violence. Yeah, no, I think it's particularly alarming that the former president of the United States has now started uh, praising Ashley Babbitt, uh, the woman who was killed, a QAnon believer and uh, former nuclear power plant and Air Force guard. Um, and uh, for someone like that to now be called a, a patriot uh, for storming the Capitol, uh, I think it is, is 
is particularly alarming. Right. And if I can just add one thing to that, I mean, in terms of thinking about accountability after the fact, so much of the focus is on criminal accountability. Um, and, you know, I think that there is an importance to that. I don't want to minimize that or say that, you know, if we suddenly stopped, you know, responding or prosecuting, you know, this, uh, you know, 700 or more people um, who, uh, you know, were part of the capital invasion, that that would, you know, that would not be a good thing. That deterrence is important. At the same time, we've got over 100 members of, um, of you know, the mob that participate on January 6th who are now running for elected office as, um, you know, voting rights officials, <laughs> as election officials, as secretaries of state in, um, in, in places and being supported by um, the former president, um, you know, who is advocating and actually, um, you know, campaigning for them. So like the, the extent of the threat is much deeper. Um, and I, I worry a bit about uh, almost an ex a predominant, if not exclusive, focus on those who participated and what they are being charged with, rather than seeing kind of the larger influences of um, subversion to um, our electoral institutions and, you know, and voting. I have a very interesting question here from uh, one of the guests, Eric Sapp, who asks whether the reactive versus preventive dichotomy, uh, uh, reactive being um, in hate crimes and preventive being in terrorism, uh, does that miss capturing what Mr. Sapp says the FBI often does, which is precipitate criminal actions by using sting operations or entrapment? Um, for example, at a recent Senate hearing, he notes that Senator Cruz asked how many FBI personnel or informants were in the January 6th crowd. I know others have recently said, for example, that the uh, plan to kidnap uh, Michigan Governor Whitmer uh, was, was uh, instigated by individuals uh, uh, helping the FBI and police. Um, how, how do you think about this problem of, of precipitation or instigation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so before I get to uh, the you know the particular allegations about um, January sixth or so forth, um, the there are serious concerns around FBI instigation, um, and you know typically and it often it flows from uh, the preventative framework by which terrorism has been or counterterrorism has been conceived. So this idea that you want to identify people who pose a risk of violence, even if it's a small risk ahead of time, in order to interrupt or disrupt that violence and prevent it or the potential violence prevent it from happening. That has been the framework. Um, but in using that framework, uh, the FBI often has engaged it with um, uh, um, finding either a confidential informants or um, undercover FBI agents themselves who will identify someone that they think is at risk of radicalization, usually on the basis of social media posts, and then approach them um, over time. And, and I think that's quite important because it's not just, you know, they're approaching someone who wants to do something tomorrow. They're often approaching someone who has made vague um, uh, uh, vague expressions that are perceived as being supportive of violence, usually online. Um, and then there, there are sometimes financial inducements involved, you know, um, to, uh, to say that if you engage in this act, then, you know, we'll promise you money. Uh, there's uh, certainly much more often even um, uh, emotional and psychological inducement offered often to, to young people. So that is a real thing. And I think many cases involving um, FBI uh, sting operations um, do generate a lot of concern. You know, are you actually um, uh, prosecuting somebody who is on you know, the cusp of violence or is it that you're actually bringing somebody further along that path um, who may not have taken steps on their own? Um, so that concern is very real. Um, that's not to say that every use of an informant is problematic. And I just want to distinguish a little bit here between the type of sting operations that we've often seen in cases um, in, you know, in the war on terror over the last couple of decades from other uses of informants. So let me just break this up for a moment. Um, there are types of informant operations which involve an informant in a relatively passive capacity observing acts, um, discussions that are already underway, for instance, among a group of people, where their role is essentially to get inside a group um, that otherwise law enforcement may not be able to get, um, you know, say, eyes and ears on. Um, but their role is not sort of inducement. It's not sort of leading people further towards active violence. It's more a passive role. And that- it's intelligence think, gathering. Yeah, sorry? Intelligence 
gathering. Yeah, it's intelligence gathering, but without kind of playing an affirmative role. Yeah, what yeah. concerns me most is when FBI operatives cross, or um, you know, confidential informants um, cross the line, as they often have, towards encouraging it, because they, in fact, have a financial or other stake in getting um, somebody um, on the hook, right? I mean, they they are promised um, a lighter sentence if they assist the government in terrorism investigation. They are sometimes promised, um, uh, you know, being free from deportation if they assist the government. Sometimes they're told by FBI agents, if you don't cooperate, um, we will put you on a terrorist watch list. Those are the allegations before a case um, that the Supreme Court heard and actually um, allowed to move forward to litigation uh, last year. So these are the kinds of concerns that I think are really serious um, involving FBI informants. Thoughts on the particular cases, the January 6th or the Michigan um, kidnap case? Yeah, so I actually, I, I, I don't want to uh, speak to those without having sort of looked at more of the facts. Um, you know, I, I think the the challenging thing here is that, you know, of course, the idea that everybody was fraying, none of this was real, you know, this is all the FBI. I mean, that's also um, uh, like a trope in our culture. And, and um, so if you're already kind of conspiracy minded, you're all, you know, you're, you are kind of predisposed to view government action in these cases as, you know, manufacturing a threat. Um, and so there's, you know, a real threat of, um, of using evidence of informants as a reason to say that this threat was entirely manufactured. And, and um, that's a concern as well. We've got one from another guest that um, I think we'll probably close with, because I'd like you, this, this would be helpful for all of us, is what kinds of research um, should we be doing in this area? We, we, we will read your piece, or you know, scholars and students will read your piece and, and be thinking about it. But what other kinds of research should we be doing about um, how to better understand how our frames in white supremacy, white supremacist violence and or hate crimes and terrorism, um, how can we do a better job of understanding this? What, what, what research do you recommend that others take on on top of your own? Yeah, um, yeah, what a, a, a great question. Um, so I'll give a, a couple of responses. Um, you know, I think we're we're a bit in uncharted territory with a lot of the policy questions that, that uh, you know that federal law enforcement and others are facing. Um, and you know, one example is just from you know recent weeks is um, you know the question of is it advisable to use something like seditious conspiracy charges against those um, involved in um, you know or some of those involved with January sixth. And you know, there's reasons to use a charge like that. There are also reasons to be concerned in light of past seditious conspiracy prosecutions and in light of concerns that those same charges and um, mechanisms can be used against other communities as um, you know, it was thought during the Trump administration to use that sort of charge against police protesters, for instance. So the, the same sorts of questions that I think I'm interested in asking about these particular frames of hate crimes and terrorism, um, that same kind of question um, might be asked both at a conceptual level and a policy level about many other policies. So, um, and so there are many things to kind of explore along those lines. Uh, I think there are important research questions around connections between law enforcement and military agencies and white supremacy. Um, that's also an area of a lot of policy movement. Um, and uh, but you know, and some worse work in that area has certainly been done by historian Kathleen um, Bellew, uh, who was at Stanford briefly on a fellowship, um, and many others. Um, but there's continuing work that I think is important to do um, along the lines of those sorts of connections. Um, and I think more broadly, uh, you know, many of us would like to see both policy responses and our thinking around a lot of these issues shift from a a kind of bad apples perspective looking at individuals to broader systemic causes and contributors. Um, yet on questions of root causes, 
there are any number of important research questions that I think need to be done so that we don't, when we look to root causes, merely reach for the root causes that seem most in line with sort of our overall ideological priors, um, but that seem based in, um, you know, as much research and, and evidence as, as possible. Uh, so I would like to see kind of more research on, um, you know, any number of explanations that are often given for kind of structural reasons. Um, for uh, the uh, persistence and, and current acceleration of white supremacist uh, violence, um, you know, uh, gun violence in, in general, um, and uh, any number of other issues that are kind of more structural at their cause. Uh, that's very, very helpful. We have time for one last question. I'm going to ask uh, Luis Rodriguez, if you could introduce yourself. And I think I've enabled you to speak now, Luis. Thank you. I think that I should be able to yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks a lot for for the presentation. It was it was very interesting. I was wondering though that since white supremacist groups are transnational groups, I wonder if other countries like Canada, designating groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers as terrorists, will affect the U.S. legislation, or if you see this kind of legislation having no effect on the U.S. or maybe pushing U.S. legislators to take different actions. Um, and thanks again for, for the presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. Um, so uh, on this, so undoubtedly, uh, white supremacist violence right now is transnational. In fact, in some of my other work, I've kind of contested the domestic international framing on the grounds that um, what we see as domestic um, is in fact not domestic. Um, uh, it probably never has been. Um, and certainly there's been more organizing um, uh, across transnational lines, even to the point of, of, of people traveling from the US to places like the Ukraine um, in order to, to, to train as terrorists. So those distinctions are quite problematic. In terms of legislation and the US taking models from abroad, like the example you gave, I think everything has to be done um, with um, uh, concern for the particular political risks. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the process of designating organizations as terrorist organizations is always going to be fraught. It involves judgments made to designate particular groups um, that then come with quite uh, significant consequences. And especially in a US context with extraordinary polarization, um, I do not support the designation or you know, the creation of new lists of terrorist organizations, in part because it gives tremendous power to agencies like um, the State Department and others um, to select out their political enemies. Um, and while this threat may seem a bit remote, like of course we can threat, you know, uh, trust these agencies to make those determinations on the belief, you know, the basis of evidence and, and so forth. Um, you know, I, we just went through four years of the Trump administration where we had government officials calling Black Lives Matter um, and many other groups uh, terrorists, uh, where the president, former president himself, called on uh, government officials to designate police protesters as terrorists. Um, and where on the other side too, for that matter, I mean, you've got like the city of San Francisco, um, you know, passing resolutions to uh, brand the uh, NRA as a terrorist organization for purposes of city law. So the potential for kind of politicized, polarized uses of these sorts of designations really concerns me, especially when their consequences are so significant in terms of um, not just the speech rights, but the, uh, the, the, the forms of investigation that are then unleashed on uh, individuals. Um, so that would be my response. Undoubtedly, a more transnational response is needed, but whether the particular models adopted uh, abroad are suitable for the US, that's a, a much more uh, a difficult question. Well, we've come to the end of the designated time and with apologies to a number of people who put in their uh, questions or comments at the last minute, I think we should end. Um, hopefully, uh, especially those of you at Stanford can uh, shoot an email uh, uh, to uh, Professor Sinar. I just wanted to close just by thank you. You've given us a lot to talk about. Um, I've read the article, it's very long, but uh, I hope we'll put it, well, like, like, like all law review articles, um, and we'll put it on, uh, with your permission, once it's out, we'll, we'll circulate it to this group because it, it's, it's really an important piece of work. And so thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.